Hi, good morning everybody. My name is Hannah de Jager. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of the Basque Country in Spain and a visiting researcher at the University of Sussex in the UK. First of all, of course, we would like to thank the organizers, Nara, Raquel and Cesar, for inviting us to this conference and to this book symposium, and in this way that is entirely consistent with climate change concerns, namely virtually. This is really exciting and I'm interested to see how it will go. We have prepared two presentations that cover some of the ideas in the book with the purpose of engaging in conversations with you. You will hear each of us talk at different points during the presentations. The way we organize these talks is that today we will first bring you the context and motivation for the book. Elena will be doing this. Then we will give a brief introduction to an action, which I will take care of. And then Ezekiel will give an explanation of what motivated us to design the, di the dialectical model of linguistic bodies and an explanation of the model itself. And then Elena will come back on with some reflections on the mode of existence of linguistic bodies. This is for today. So tomorrow then we will talk about what it means to develop as linguistic bodies. Ezekiel will do this. For, for instance, he will talk about full linguistic engagement and the messiness of this. Then we will give two hypotheses about autistic linguistic bodies and some hypotheses and examples. And then Elena will come back to finish it off. She will talk about languaging, gesture and grammar and so on. And also finally indicate some open directions and say something about what, how we reflect on ethics from this approach. So before going into the context and motivation presented by Elena, Ezekiel will now also briefly introduce himself and then we will go to Elena's introduction and the first part for today of the presentation itself. So here comes Ezekiel. Hello everybody, my name is Ezekiel Di Paolo. I am a research professor at Iker Basque, the Basque Science Foundation, here in the Basque Country in Spain. And I would like to thank everyone for being here and to participate in this symposium for which I'm very excited, especially to the organizers Nara, Cesar and Raquel. It's only a pity that we have not managed to be there in person, but I hope that we still be able to have some interesting discussions. Good morning. My name is Elena Kafari. I am an assistant professor of philosophy and the chair of the philosophy department in um, Worcester State University in Worcester, Massachusetts in the United States. I'd like to echo uh, Ezekiel and Hannah's thanks to everyone for being here to participate in this symposium today with us and especially to thank uh, Nara, Cesar and Raquel for their great work organizing this event and working with our various complicated lives and schedules. Um, I look forward to speaking with everybody more directly soon. And I will now get started with the first part of our presentation for today. Thanks. Okay, so the first talk that we will give you this morning is entitled Linguistic Bodies, Context in Action and Model. And I'll begin speaking about the context and motivation of this project. Uh, so why this book? What is unique about this treatment of language and bodies? I imagine that each of us, uh, of each of the three authors, might answer this question with slightly different emphases or by attending to different aspects of what is certainly a multifaceted project. Um, since I'm introducing the project, I'll speak for myself and, and say I have been mesmerized by bodies doing language since childhood. Um, the Helen Keller story in particular um, and her work with her teacher, Annie Sullivan, left deep imprints, specifically the physicality of how Helen learns language and the, the intimacy and the collaboration of their bodily relationship as this child who cannot speak or because she cannot see or hear makes contact with the world through this contact with her nearly blind teacher. Annie Sullivan, and I would wonder, isn't languaging this physical and this relational and this intimate and bodily for all of us, but something about the way we do it, the way we think about it, doesn't let this come through, especially in scholarship. So later as a student, I was compelled by 
image schemas in the work of Mark Johnson and Lakoff and Johnson, and other accounts from cognitive linguistics of categories that showed them to be not transcendent or a priori, but firmly rooted in the contingencies of human embodiment. But as we will get to in more detail in tomorrow's talk, there are limits to how more traditional work in linguistics, psychology, and philosophy, even the cognitive and even the embodied branches of these fields, are positioned to explain phenomena like hand gesturing, knowing other minds, or differences in bodies and sense making. Discourses in these fields of cognitive science we find are too often attached to certain metaphors about the mind, that it is a machine, that it is a computer, that it is inside the head, that it is equal to the brain, or designed by genes to promote the replication of genes, and also attached to certain ideas about bodies, that they are well described by a single default standard, that they are as interchangeable as hardware, that they work in linear, predictable, abstract ways like robots, that they are dumb, or that they at best provide data which will be become intelligible elsewhere. It's easy to fall into the logic of these deeply entrenched ways of thinking about our own thinking, and from there it is easy to think that if our brains are processors, then they must be processing something. And we look for what those entities could be. We reify the stream of languaging activity into pieces or bits of information and house these in an awkward conceptual space somewhere in between knowledge and reality. We ask how we can communicate successfully and miss that the activity of scholarly inquiry is a process of making sense together. We ask how we can ever accurately talk about the world and we miss that our very asking belies a truer picture of language as what we are always already doing as part of the world of knowing and thinking and acting. And yet, presumably, cognitive science should have something to say about language. Our linguistic bodies theory enacts a faithful following of the dictum of cognitive linguistics, which is that theoretical and scientific studies of language must be informed by our best current working understanding of cognition. But sometimes the most faithful following of a thesis requires its complete inversion. If we take inactive cognitive science as our best account of cognition, that means taking seriously the claim that mind is life, living bodies are minded. And this means that in order to situate ourselves as researchers in such a way that we can meaningfully relate to the open totality of language, we have to do two things. We have to attend to many, if not all, many if not all aspects of human living as bodily living, and we have to find a way of beginning in the always already. Right? We are always already in continuity with the natural world. We are always already involved with other people and with meaningful projects. Our intuition is that language use and change constrain, enable, and even constitute a particular bodily mode of existence. Yet this bodily mode of existence is diverse and unfinished. We move from then a presumed universality of the body to the concrete universality of linguistic bodies. We flip the paradigm of language is embodied to human bodies are linguistic. But following the logic of cognitive linguistics to its necessary inversion still leaves much work to be done. What do bodies do when they are languaging? How do we go from the dynamic processes that constitute organic, sensory, motor, and intersubjective bodies, and the synergies and coordination they enter into during social encounters, to a more specific discourse about utterances, dialogues, interpretation, expression, signs, symbols, syntax, and, and so on? Another way of saying this is, how can we go from these core concepts in the inactive philosophy that mind is life and we'll be speaking about these throughout the talk, to these nuances of language and these intricacies of our human existence as linguistic bodies. So that is our, our goal in the book and today.
In 2015, we published a paper that aimed to refine and advance upon Umberto Maturana's idea of languaging as a manner of living. We wanted to respond to skeptics who challenge inactivism to connect lower level sense making with higher order sophisticated moves like those commonly ascribed to language and to provide technical models in support of a positive account of language derived solely from an active principles and participatory sense making. The 2018 book, Linguistic Bodies, is an updated, more complete, and more extended version of that positive story. So in other words, we believe that the ingredients for a holistic and human level, non-reductive, non-representational approach to language are already there in the inactive philosophy of mind when deployed from a logical origin point or primordial tension of participatory sense making. And you can see that in looking at the way we've organize the book and also our, our talk for today. In the book, the first part, Bodies, gives an inactive theory of bodies and the dimensions of embodiment, organic, sensory motor, and intersubjective. Also, their entanglement, historicity, and diversity, which help to demonstrate uh, a primordial tension from which we derive a dialectical model in the second part, linguistic bodies. We move from participatory sense making from this basic tension uh, that arises from the complexity of bodies and interaction to linguistic bodies, and we look for those missing categories from the diagram earlier. And then in the third and final part of the book, we consider applications that this theory has to language acquisition, autism, grammaticalizing, symbolizing, gesturing, reading and writing, truth processes, linguistic vulnerabilities, microaggressions, institutional utterances, and the ethics of participation. We will get to some of these points tomorrow. But for right now, I will turn the talk over to Hannah de Jaeger, who will be speaking about bodies from an inactive perspective. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Elena. So indeed, I will talk about inaction and about bodies. What I will do is just a very brief introduction to the inactive approach, beginning here by situating inaction in relation to functionalism and non-representationalism, so, the inactive approach is embodied, but it's definitely not functionalist and not representationalist. Um, there has been a lot of work done in inaction and also in the other areas, but of course we will talk here about inaction in the last three or four decades, starting with, of course, The Embodied Mind, written by Francisco Varela, Evan Thompson and Eleanor Roche in 1991. And in the last years, many books have appeared. There is, for instance, the work by Daniel Hutto and Eric Mein on inactivism, or Thomas Fuchs's recent book, Ecology of the Brain, among many others. Here I will talk about um, two principles of inaction, the life-mind continuity and our approach to embodiment that we take especially in this book and that I think is a real innovation of the book, which is that we talk about bodies, many different bodies actually. So one of the basic principles of an action is the life-mind continuity, which means that living beings share across the whole range of complexity some element of mindedness of, or of sense-making. And so the life-mind continuity means that the most minimal living beings up to the most high-level human beings, so to speak, like humans, share what it takes to be sense makers. And we have been critiqued uh, for this approach to an action for the question of, of how is embodiment going to scale up to human knowing? Isn't it all just about simple forms of embodiment? And how will we go to things like language or mathematics? And of course, in our book, we proposed an approach that goes all the way to language, which is traditionally one of the pinnacles of human cognition. But we are not reaching for language in a traditional way of thinking about cognition, which is functional and based on representations or the classical dichotomies between mind and body, reason and feeling, object and subject, and so on. No, we are reaching this pinnacle of human knowing, namely language, in an inactive way. Part of what we do in this presentation today and tomorrow is to show how we reach this highest form of human knowing, namely language, on an inactive logic. For this, we have developed a technical vocabulary already over many years, and this inactive vocabulary is one of operational definitions of things like autonomy, agency, adaptivity, sense-making, participatory sense-making, and so on. 
So our work in this book continues to build on this, and here we go in search of an active approach to language. And for this, we have to start with bodies. So we start really with an idea that is expressed in this quote by Aimé Césaire, who is a, a poet, author and politician from Martinique. And he says, I am not burying myself in a narrow particularism, but neither do I want to lose myself in an emaciated universalism. There are two ways to lose oneself, walled segregation in the particular or dilution in the universal. My conception of the universal is that of, an, of a universal enriched by all that is particular, a universal enriched by every particular, the deepening and coexistence of all particulars. So we begin from a quite similar idea, which I think is one of the real innovations of this book. We look at actual, particular, concrete bodies in their concrete situations and investigate the universality of how they act and relate in and through language, by languaging. So we talk about dimensions of embodiment, or rather many different bodies, and we begin with defining organic, sensory, motor and intersubjective bodies. So first, Organic bodies, and this is something that human bodies share with minimal living systems, organic bodies are precarious processes of metabolic self-individuation and adaptive coupling to the environment. So this means that an autopoietic system or an autonomous system in its relation with its environment, but mainly in its self-organization, actually, if you look at what is going on in an autopoietic system in more detail, you see that actually it consists of a tension between two tendencies that pull in opposite directions. And these tendencies are that of self-production and self-distinction. So an autopoietic system is both and continually busy self-producing and self-distinguishing. Self-production is the process by which it takes in matter and energy from the environment into its own self-organization and produces itself on the basis of this, and at the same time, it self-distinguishes from the environment. This means that it has to reject certain elements from the environment and have a boundary to the environment. It can't just l let everything in. And these two tendencies, if the living system were to engage in them, only in one of them uh, consistently, this would be to the detriment of the other, and this would actually lead to the death of the system, because continual self-production would mean complete openness, and continual self-distinction would mean complete closeness to the environment, and neither of these are viable on their own. So this inherent tension between these two ten tendencies has to be resolved, and the autopoietic system, or the autopoie autopoietic adaptive system, does this through agency. And agency means that a self-organizing system determines what comes into its self-organization and what it keeps out of its self-organization in the process of regulating its interactions with the environment. And so we see that in this diagram here, especially the diagram on the right, where this agency actually means that the self-organizing system regulates its interactions with the environment. Agency is resolving this tension between too much self-production and too much self-distinction by regulating the interaction with the environment. Then sensory motor bodies are precarious processes of self-individuation in the network of sensory motor structures in a living agent. So here we don't only have an organic body, but a sensory motor body. And this has been explained in the book, The Sensory Motor Life. And here, what this is mainly about is that the processes that individuate a sensory motor agent are acts themselves. It is acts, the acts of an agent, that constitute and reassert a new kind of agency, one that is enabled and constrained, but ultimately underdetermined by biology, so by the organic body. It is literally a case of explaining who you are by referring to what you do and explaining what you do by referring to who you are. So the theory begins with the idea of a sensory motor scheme, similar to Piaget's ideas, and explores how sensory motor schemes organize into self-sustaining networks, building up sensory motor repertoires with clustered activities corresponding to micro-worlds, for instance the activities of gardening, cooking, getting dressed, etc. 
So in this approach, we can see that habits are self-sustaining, precarious sensory motor schemes. And that sensory motor agency consists of clusters of self-sustaining sensory motor schemes, achieving closure and fulfilling the requirements for agency at the sensory motor level. Then sensory motor bodies are indeed different from organic bodies because they organize themselves differently. Sensory motor bodies are constituted by being enacted as a socio-materially embedded network of practices. So here we see the agency that we just saw of regulating the interactions with the environment. Um, this now involves also a self-organization at the sensory motor level. We see the inner circle being the self-organization at the organic level and the outer circle with the arrow is the self-organization at the sensory motor level in interaction with the environment. Then we also are intersubjective bodies. And these are the precarious processes of self-individuation in relations with others. And here we come to bodies that are enacted together. So we also come to the idea of participatory sense-making, which means how we understand each other involves deeply affecting each other in our activities of sense-making. So here interaction processes between people also emerge and exist between them and take on a certain autonomy or life of their own and hereby interaction processes between people influence and co-determine the intentions of the people who are participating in these interactions. So intersubjectivity or participatory sense-making is then understood as the interplay between interactive and individual autonomies. So people can literally participate in each other's intentions by moving together, by coordinating their self-organization together with other people. In this case, we see that agency, the regulation of the interactions with the environment, now also includes the regulation of interactions with other people and the environment. So we have self-regulation and regulations of the interactional process with another person, plus regulations of interactions with the environment. And this is a very basic tension that we will keep referring to in the rest of this presentation. It's the basis of the inactive approach to language that we propose in the book. The final point I would like to make about this approach to an action that I just briefly presented here is that the bodies that I've just spoken about, the sensory motor, the organic and the intersubjective, are entangled with each other, that there is historicity to them and the great diversity to bodies, as Elena already mentioned as well. So what is important to remember is that bodies always care. Bodily self-organization is precarious and the dimensions of embodiment are not distinct from each other, nor super, superimposed one on top of the other, but they interpenetrate in complex enabling and constraining relations. For example, when you are smoking, this impacts your organic body, but it's also a matter of a sensory motor habit that might be difficult to break, even if your organic body would definitely benefit from being able to break this habit. Another example is that in couples who have a good marital relationship, their health is impacted by this in the sense that, it, that for instance, wounds can heal more quickly when the, when the relationship between these people is good. So these are interesting relations between the dimensions of embodiment. The dimensions of embodiment are not distinct from each other, nor superimposed one on top of the other, but they interpenetrate in complex enabling and constraining relations. The bodies, we could say, are anchored to each other, or they share an anchoring. The organic sensory motor and intersubjective bodies do not fully coincide with each other, but are anchored together, not on a solid, fully coherent floor and ever stable center, but to a relatively softer process of path-dependent enactments. We are always busy. We work at being these bodies. This moving anchor can be experienced as the changing vantage point that comes to the fore in different situations. So each body is a path-dependent, ongoing achievement, a history of adaptations and compensations, of incorporations and environmental modifications that span the three dimensions of embodiment without being fully determined by any single one of them. This is something that we work at.
Contrast this with the very abstract body of functionalist approaches, where the body could be an anonymous body laying on an operating table. In our view, there is no universal one body, but instead there are billions of different human bodies. So this, so far my introduction to the inactive approach to bodies that we propose in this book. Now I would like to give it over to Ezekiel, who will talk about how we go from here to linguistic bodies. In this part of the talk, we're going to move from this overview of inactive ideas about embodiment to the specific questions uh, that we address in the book concerning linguistic bodies. As we have said, our idea is to try to find a way to cover the gap between the life of the sensory motor agent, the living organism, uh, to the categories that we typically use to describe language. What are those mason circles? How can we fill those gaps in a systematic way? First, I need to say a few things about what kind of theory we are looking for that will clarify a little bit why we choose certain methods and certain approaches. The first point to be remarked is that um, we consider language um, as kind of a game changer in our understanding of uh, cognition. In the words of Charles Taylor, what we are after is a constitutive theory of language. What does that mean? It means that language is not simply the addition of several um, pre-existent cognitive capabilities that are put together and then at some point simply we call them linguistic. In fact, language changes and repurposes all of our human capabilities from our sensory motor life to our biological being. So that is the kind of theory that we're going for, one where language is not simply just one more skill to be added to our repertoire of skills. And something that will come up, but also to later today and tomorrow's talk, is the idea of a sensitivity to the issue of rightness. By that, the important thing to remember at the moment is simply that by creating language, we also create a world of um, images, objectivity, ways of telling whether something is correct or incorrect, that is beyond simply the adequacy uh, of whether the behavior works or not. But we'll come back to that later. So, where do we start? I mean, if you open any um, traditional book on cognitive linguistics or you know, any approach to language in general, you typically will find a picture like this, where you get all the different parts of language, all the different sub-disciplines of linguistics, order in some way, it doesn't matter what way, but in a way, the point being that you can study all these things to some extent disconnected from each other. We want to discard this picture. For us, language actually is more like a ball made of rubber bands, where you start pulling at one particular uh, thread and all kinds of connections to all the other parts come with it. So language, in our perspective, uh, is best approached as a totality. And the problem is, therefore, that as a totality we have to choose a method that will be adequate for studying such totalities because if we start with parts, well, the question is, do you need to isolate the parts? We need to see how they relate. Say you pick up a particular aspect of language that you think is important, and therefore you try to say, well, this is the central idea of language, and other ideas are derived from it. Well, the problem is that when you start adding all these connections, the central idea is already transformed into something else. So what we need is a different method. The method we have chosen is the dialectical method, which goes from holes towards more concrete holes by a series of dialectical steps. We will see this method in action to see exactly what we mean by it. And there's a lot to be said, and I will simply just introduce some of the main ideas here. By 
Saying that we move in the direction of increased concreteness, we are not trying to say that we are necessarily approaching language in the real world as it is, ideally, yes, but what we're trying to say is that we move towards conceptual structures that reveal the interrelations in more and more detail between all the different parts and the different concepts. In the words, in the words of Karl Marx, the concrete is concrete because it's a concentration of many determinations, hence the unity of the diverse. So, has this, is this new? Is this a new uh, idea? Absolutely not. In psychology and in philosophy, we have seen applications of dialectical ideas, sometimes called dialectical, sometimes not, um, in the work of Tran Duc Tao and, and the you know, extensions of phenomenology into dialectics and the work on the origin of language in the work of Marco Ponti on gesture and sedimentation and the prose of the world. In psychology, we have people like Lev Vygotsky and the whole activity theory um, in psychology. And, and then, even to these days, then philosophers like Eval Ilyenkov, who have also connected the philosophical aspect with the psychological uh, applications, such as the education, of children who are deaf and blind using dialectical ideas. In an action, we have uh, been uh, nourishing ourselves with dialectical ideas from biologists like Richard Levins and Richard Lewontin, who look at evolution of the organism as the subject and object of evolution, and in psychology and psychoanalysis, Jessica Benjamin, and in feminist critique, people like Bell Hooks. So all of these are just examples, there are more examples, that we're not saying anything new here. But when we talk about the concrete, perhaps I need to clarify this further. Here, the work of Givercy Mondon on the uh, philosophy of technology may help. Uh, he speaks about the concretization of uh, technical artifacts and uh, technical objects as their um, transformation into a set of increasingly complex internal and external relations with the milieu through the evolution and use of an artifact. So this clarifies what we mean by moving towards more concreteness. If we have something like a carburetor of a car, which is here is presented in the most abstract possible way as a diagram, uh, we move to something more concrete if we have a picture of the actual material system that works as a carburetor. But that's just one first step. We can also move further and see how it fits in the context of a car engine, how it fits in the context of uh, work that is done around it, how it can be used in different ways or changed in different ways, and how all of this fits within the context of uh, a society that uses cars, an economy that produces and maintains them, and so on and so forth. So the idea is to try to see how we can move towards something that will allow us to explain this rubber ball. So for that, we presented a model. Uh, it's a complex model, and I'm not going to explain every single step of the model in this uh, presentation, because it would definitely take us too much time. But I think I'll be able to highlight some elements of it that are really perhaps the most salient or will allow us to have some discussions later. So we need to do what we just done in the example before, uh, have a starting point that would allow us to generate possible internal tensions in an idea, in, a, in an abstract idea, and move from that stage toward more concrete stages. Our starting point is the idea of participatory sense-making, which has heard about it just now. Uh, what is this? The concept is uh, very general. We're talking about all kinds of situations that involve agents and participants altering, orienting, modulating, enabling, and even constituting uh, the sense-making of others in situations of interaction. This is fundamental for all kinds of uh, human socia sociality and intersubjectivity. And we call this a whole because it, it describes a whole situation, but it's very general. So it's a very abstract whole. 
So we saw that diagram before. And this will be our starting point. Without specifying anything else, we say, let's consider a situation of participatory sense making. It doesn't have to be between two participants, it can be more, but this is the, you know, the typical way in which we express this in the diagram. What would it look like to move from here to something that resembles language? Well, it looks like this. This is a very complex model, but I'm not going to <laughs> go through everything here, but we will use this to uh, highlight some elements. So we have at the top the very beginning of participatory sense making, and we will end up at the bottom with something that we will call incorporation and incarnation of utterances. Now, that at the very bottom is going to be part of the definition of what it means to be a linguistic bodies. And that will help us answer the question, what do bodies do when they are languaging? What is actually happening? What's actually happening is that very difficult to disentangle simply by empirical observation, simply because we will see that many of these elements, these stages in the model, are often um, they often are overlapping or subsumed in very subtle aspects of our languaging. It could be a gesture that subsumes all kinds of important uh, regulatory and expressive parts of this model. And to disentangle that, we need to proceed with this method. So what are these arrows or these lines that open up from each central concept? These are the internal tensions of that concept at that stage. And the arrows that converge to the next concept are an empirically validated or found uh, way of regulating and transforming those tensions. And as you can see, the tensions simply get re-expressed into new tensions. They don't fully disappear. So what is the first stage? Well, the first stage is the primordial tension of participatory sense-making. We have that when we are acting in a situation of social interactions, uh, my moves, my participation in it is overdetermined because it follows on the one hand my individual norms as an embodied cognitive being, but they also form parts of the sustaining of an interactive situation. Therefore, they follow uh, interactive norms as well. Therefore, there's always an ever-present uh, possibility of interactive dissonance. I may perform a certain act or move that follows something that I feel is totally fine because it follows my own embodied normativity, such as if I'm distracted, I can look sideways uh, while I'm talking to you. But you may find that that has a significance for the interaction. Uh, for example, I am not paying fully attention to your, what you're saying. So that means we have to uh, somehow harmonize these two different um, normativities. Can I just do it myself and make sure that this is all har harmonic? Well, no, because I cannot control you. Participatory sense-making implies that we are in an interactive situation and therefore we have to remain autonomous agents while we are at it. So if I impose myself a certain top-down coordination, it just simply won't be a social interaction situation anymore. So the solution is to co-regulate. That is to say, we together must find a way that uh, we connect or coordinate our sensory motor schemes beyond the simple influence that we have on each other, but actually try to move together in both attending to our own embodied normativities and interactive normativities, not necessarily consciously, of course. So the co-regulation in the scheme of um, sensory motor schemes using these diagrams is different from just mutual influence. And this is a very simple, subtle point, but it's not so important at the moment, but I mention it. At the top, you have that sensory motor coordinations in the agent that is on the left can influence say, environmental conditions on the sensory motor coordinations on the edges on the right, but that's different from the, the diagram at the bottom when the 
co-regulation actually, you know, initiates a coordination in the other person or helps stabilize the coordination in the other person. I am actually being part together of uh, the act that you are making. And for that, the only way I can do it is, or that can happen, is if you also uh, let things be, let it happen that the other has an influence on you. If we both accept this situation and we both accept to be let, let be influenced by others, we may resolve that initial uh, participatory sense-making tension. So we move from that participatory sense-making to something that we call co-regulated social acts. Social acts, we mean by this acts whose completion require more than one single agent. Say, I, I give you an object and you accept it. Uh, that means that I cannot really finish that act unless you, you know, respond accordingly. So the act must be enacted together. Shaking hands is, is another example. In some cases we do this spontaneously, in other cases we have sedimented uh, repertoires for what we call partial acts. The parts, the giving and the accepting, or two parts of a handshake, uh, we call them partial acts. And what is interesting about these is that they form classes of equivalence and complementarity. So the giving is complementary to the accepting. Different forms of giving are probably equivalent, not necessarily all of them, but you know, will probably be equivalent and still be part of the same social act. This is for an example of different ways of you know, shaking hands or what is called the dap phenomenon and here that you do all kinds of interesting movements and, and these are coordinated partial acts constituting a social act. To do this, we must already be in some way able to co-regulate our interactions. Now, what happens next? I mean, I'm not going to go through all the details here. We can look at the fact that these partial acts will, you know, create all kinds of repertoires and we can use ways of um, recursively using these partial acts to regulate other partial acts. Overall, what is important to highlight here is that these acts uh, show their own normativity. And that is a normativity that is above the normativity of our embodied sensory motor normativity. Because partial acts, you know, the first half of a handshake entails or suggests that the, the right response would be another half of a handshake. There is an adequacy of the equivalent and complementary parts of the partial act. Moreover, partial acts can be used themselves to regulate this coordination, such as when I nod or when I do a gesture to proceed or stop or, you know, highlight something positive or not that will change the way we are trying to coordinate the partial acts. So you see how we went from a very abstract situation of coordination in the in general, participatory sense making in general, to a more specific form, which is the recursive regulation of partial acts in a social situation. We move on. Uh, I'm not going to go here through the whole thing, but one thing to highlight is that so far we have participatory sense making, if you like, at the local level between the people who are interacting, but then a dialectic of distance and intimacy appears when we introduce the possibility of long distance interactions or interactions that happen with other members of the community that are not part of our local group. Here, uh, what's relevant or interesting is that that same normativity of partial acts can resolve these questions of how we coordinate uh, between different local normativities. And this is because some partial acts are going to be strongly normative. Um, so we call them portable partial acts, which are strongly regulatory and help move across local pragmatics in a two-way influence between the local and the global. Take a gesture to stop advancing. This is a partial act that can be used to regulate other partial acts, but it's also strongly normative in the sense that any intensification of these gestures becomes a direct sensory motor engagement with the other person's body. You know, if you stop, if you know, if you don't stop advancing, this you know, an extended hand will essentially stop you anyway. <laughs> 
or show you that you need to stop. In, so this strong normativity is what allows local pragmatics to diffuse into the community. Our ways, if you like, to easily translate between local pragmatics. So that's the uh, level of community of interactors. Um, but yeah, we still have a problem here that uh, once this community has all kinds of um, strongly regulatory acts, like you know speaking very loudly and demand the attention of others, what prevents uh, users to attempt to use such acts all the time and therefore potentially breaking, introducing a tension in the situation of interaction that could break it. So there is, if you like, a tension between the regulator role and the regulated role that happens during the enactment of a strongly normative partial act. Well, the solution here is to spread this tension over time, provided that you are regulating I will allow myself to be regulated if I have the possibility of changing roles. And this is the beginning of uh, a mutual recognition situation because now I'm not simply... The situation at, at the original point was so abstract that we didn't even have that mutual recognition, but now we have to have it because I need to know who's regulating, who's regulated. Um, know them as regulators, not just know them as, as agents. So, and spreading these possibilities over time means that I will accept, you know, for instance, you taking a role of, in, you know, directing the interaction for a while, provided that I can move into that role later. This is the beginning of a dialogical situation. Um, Okay, all kinds of interesting things already happen here because we can call each of these moves that are organized in this way utterances. By utterances, we do not mean necessarily spoken or signed utterances. It could be, you know, and showing you a demonstration of how something works. So something that could be part of a response to somebody um, asking for, you know, this information. Um, so these are dialogical acts that are enacted between a producer and an audience that mutually recognize each other and enable each other to live in those roles. Uh, they have pragmatic and ex expressive dimensions and they have an inbuilt aggressivity and mutuality. By these elements and by these uh, uh, properties, utterances uh, have what we call person-constituting powers by addressing you, I am helping you sustain yourself, if you like, as the actor, the social actor that you are. Um, moving on, we have self-control and mutual interpretation. Uh, this happens a bit later in the model, but the possibility of using utterances to control my uh, or direct themselves uh, towards, towards myself is what allows me to control how I regulate my utterances and how, therefore, enter into situations in which the sociality of dialogical encounters can be enacted only also if I am on my own. And it, this introduces new tensions that can be um, further transformed by uh, the possibility of reporting utterances the tension of you know, misinterpretation, the possibilities of having to check what we say or reflect the possi the, in a dialogue, in, in, for instance, in, the, in situations of interactions, we use, we use reflection of the syntax of a grammar of another person that has immediately, immediately spoken before us. Overall, this leads us to the last tension, which is if we are all the time incorporating utterances from others, and these utterances are also person-constitutive, we're also incarnating partially the agencies of others. In a way, it is as if our linguistic being is made up of the linguistic utterances have left traces in us of conversations that have gone on for a long time before. This is what we mean by linguistic bodies. 
autonomous agencies constituted by the braided flows of self and other directed utterances. Linguistic bodies, therefore, have to navigate an open and unresolved tension between incorporation of utterances and incarnation of agencies entail in those utterances. Often we find ourselves that we think or we hear the voice of others in a situation, or somebody remarks to us, that's what your mother would say, what you just said. Things like that means that uh, the, it's a paradox because we are making ourselves as linguistic bodies with these skills, but these skills are always inviting other agencies into our own uh, constitution. This is nicely illustrated here by this sculpture by Juan Muñoz, um, where we see uh, two people engage in a conversation, but in detail we see that there are little people flowing in between them. So, linguistic bodies, they are unfinished because they don't f end up in a resolve uh, tension, they end up in an open tension, um, and they have to navigate this tension all the time. We are, have no way in which to do that except by simply doing it every day, and meaning that, that we are able to do this in many different ways, and there are literally billions of ways of navigating this tension. And because we are unfinished linguistic bodies, we are vulnerable, because language is always risky. There's always the possibility that we may say what we don't mean, mean what we don't say, etc., or just create a situation where uh, all the levels and all the possible tensions that we're always uh, um, living through break apart, create a situation of breakdown that requires repairing. This is not how to put it, this is not just something that happens to be a negative aspect of languaging. This is the essence of languaging. We need language because we have created this, this situation of managing tensions. And if there were no tensions, there would be no language. Finally, to symbolize a little bit what we said earlier, we have the sensory motor agency scheme because we are incarnating other agencies, we try to represent this this way, um, almost as if there are we are interacting with other sensory motor agencies, are sometimes literally interacting, sometimes we are interacting with the sedimented remnants of the conversations we have had with them, and so on, and we hear their voices. This is the scheme that makes a um, representation of what a linguistic agency would be like. And I'm going to stop here so that we can move to the final part of the talk. So thank you, Ezekiel. I will just um, spend a few minutes now reflecting on the modes of existence of linguistic bodies. So we have, as you've seen um, and will see, a few ways of formulating a definition of linguistic bodies. But the entire book also needs to be seen as an answer to the question, what are linguistic bodies or what is meant by this term? So in answering that, we're always reiterating some of the key points just made and anticipating some of what you'll hear tomorrow. A linguistic body is always bodies, plural, a unique entanglement of bodies that live, move, act, interact, and make sense according to a special social agency or a special organization, which is what we are calling linguistic. This agency or organization does not arise necessarily as an evolutionary or phylogenetic process. So in defining linguistic bodies, we are not yet talking about ontogenetic processes of language acquisition or development that um, all linguistic bodies realize and through which they enact sensitivities and powers. Ezekiel will be talking about this tomorrow. Rather, ontologically speaking, linguistic bodies are those that engage in participatory sense making and in so doing, they experience and learn, navigate, and regulate the tensions that are inherent in these cognition constituting encounters. Because they are bodies, um, linguistic bodies strive to make sense in environments in the ways we've been outlining, and because these bodies live, face, and shape environments together with others as members of a group or a family or community, and in asymmetrical positions and relations not only to the environments but also to each other, 
the striving to make sense happens in ways that are at once autonomous and heteronymous, dynamic, open-ended, and co-authored. The dialectic expansion model that Ezekiel just discussed shows that these basic structural arrangements generate sedimented and spontaneous meaning-making practices that bodies enact. This enacting transforms bodies and their meaning-making conditions into linguistic bodies. So I'll give you five formulations of a definition. Linguistic bodies are bodies. They follow our um, definition for bodies that Hannah outlined earlier, not in the sense of an analogy with sensory motor, or organic, or interactive, intersubjective bodies, but a continuity with how life organizes and individuates itself. Here, the sustaining milieu to which linguistic bodies regulate their relation, or the feeding material, is utterances, which are embodied social activities. We can say that linguistic bodies are participatory sense makers who deal in dialogical acts, who co-regulate relations to shared environments through utterances in addition to other actions and sense making moves. So they are those who do this sort of co-regulation. And this co-regulation takes the form of utterance braiding, as you just heard about. So linguistic bodies are autonomous agencies constituted by the braided flows of self and other directed utterances. So what again is utterance braiding? This comes from reported utterances being recursively used to jointly construct dialogues out of multiply authored fragments. Reported utterances are how participants co-regulate an ongoing dialogue because they enable them to act together while still maintaining a dialogic frame. So in other words, if we start talking about the conversation we're in the midst of having, this meta-dialogic activity is still itself dialogic. If I report your utterance, it at once involves me in it, comments on or interprets it, and presents it back to you no longer just for me as recipient, but for both of us as shared object of sense-making and problem-solving. Utterance braiding acknowledges that utterances do not occur simultaneously but do involve each other, carrying on or carrying forward previous utterances and thereby specifically conditioning the next ones. And since reports can be made on utterances produced on other occasions, utterance braiding incorporates historical threads as well. So a flow of braided utterances is a dialogue that can be had with others or oneself. And just to comment on personal autonomy and how this comes about here from community autonomy, we can get this closed set of relations between the dialogic frame and the utterances in a self-directed flow. And this will be analogous to sensory motor schemes and agency. Utterances establish frames of relevance that can influence a linguistic agent's intentions, motives, emotion, which she can make sense of and how. While sustaining these flows, a linguistic agent is capable of effectively coupling with other linguistic agents in actual dialogue. So it's participating in that flow that opens one or puts one in a place to be able to couple with other linguistic agents. But this autonomy must be, we must know, belongs to the community as much as to the individual and can even be experienced as an alien power or an automatic doing or an unknown knowledge. Right, the way that we are able to do these things, the incorporated flows of utterances that make up a linguistic agent are always the joint result of personal enactments and of patterns that live in the community, which can be experienced in an impersonal way. And I think that that tension of sedimentation and spontaneity was very well described in the previous section. We can also say that linguistic bodies are navigators specifically of the tensions between incorporation of utterances and incarnation of the agencies that are entailed in the person constituting powers of utterances. And you did also hear about this in the last section. Just to recapitulate, in incorporation, uh, the utterances in the braided flows most often come from somewhere else. They're not de novo all the time. They are from the past or from outside, and they're made my own. They're made part of my own flow through this process or processes we're calling incorporation that are very analogous to sensory motor incorporation. So I work the utterance into my repertoire, my flow of self-directed utterances that makes me me or marks my style. This is a self-assertion of embodied agency. And utterances are transformed in this process, and the incorporating agent is also transformed, which is why we can speak of this in terms of assimilation and accommodation.
Then on the other hand, with an incarnation, this is the pull away from myself by embodying another. This is the assertion of ways of being human that incarnate in particular human bodies because the traces of others are embedded in utterances. Utterances assign dialogic roles like producer or audience, and they um, entail built-in recognition. So these traces of others are not erasable from the processes that sustain the identity of a linguistic agent. To use an utterance is to summon and enact a producer-audience split. To self-direct an utterance invokes an audience. Um, and if you see yourself as the audience, if you're talking to yourself, then you are invoking a producer or enacting that producer, which could be another person yet again. So others, both concrete or vague, become part of the sense making, along with their perspectives, attitudes, voices, gestures, movements, personalities, ways of relating, and so on. This is the constant and unfinished tension of linguistic bodies. And then there's another way that linguistic bodies are, are unfinished or somehow negatively constituted, and this is how linguistic bodies are self-displacing. They're, um, they're, the, the figure here is meant to show the fundamental decentering that is part of having this linguistic agency. Linguistic bodies are defined, as we just saw, by the tendency to make up an identity out of materials that bring into play the influence of others and other identities. But because of this influence, linguistic bodies are also defined by a counter tendency towards decoherence. This has a positive and negative side. It, it enables us to take a stance on oneself, to act on and regulate one's relation to communities and institutions, as well as one's sense of self or feelings and practices. Um, this is all afforded by linguistic mediation or decentering. But at the same time, um, and it also enables at the same time self-criticism at a broader level, at the level of dialogue, a genre, or a community. It should also destabilize, though, our notion of a very rigid, solid, um, permanent self, sort of a la uh, the way that Francisco Varela in Ethical Know-How has challenged the notion of a, of a self. And we have um, a variety of references throughout the text to an alternate metaphysics of understanding the self in light of our reflections on linguistic bodies. So just to segue to tomorrow's activities, we will begin again uh, with Ezekiel talking in more detail about processes and features of becoming linguistic bodies. We will also hear from Hannah on autistic linguistic bodies, and I will speak on what this means, what the theory means for language, quote, as we know it in terms of grammar, symbol, gesture, and, and potentially narrative. Thank you very much for your attention.